complete wreck havoc on your physical health and vice versa. And I talk a lot about mental wellness because, you know, the reality is that, you know, we all have both physical health and we both have mental health. We have those things. And we talk sometimes about physical wellness, but it's so very important that you are doing those things that have that mental wellness as well. Um, especially right now where there's sometimes you can feel like, am I coming or going, uncertainty, all of those things can have that direct connection on each other. And so again, as I said, I feel like there's that imposter syndrome because I feel like I know that you already know that. But I've, if you're anything like me, sometimes you need that reminder in your life to focus on that. Um, and so because of that, I think one of the things that I like to really look at is really that association. So looking at the association between the mental and physical health. So really, Poor mental health is a risk factor for so many chronic physical conditions. Um, and it can really look at terms of really with serious mental health conditions, um, there can be at risk of experiencing chronic or physical health conditions. And then people with chronic physical conditions are at risk of developing really poor mental health. So it can be that ongoing back and forth relationship. Um, and it, those things are all interconnected. Um, and again, that's because we are all interconnected, that mind, body, that soul, all of that is all connected within each other. And I like this next really kind of image um, because it can really kind of show you a little bit more um, closely in terms of what you're looking at. So, you know, you can see that diabetes, and these are some studies, and I'm, I have the, the, the references that I can show. So, um, the, so a couple of different things that come up, which is really taking a look at a study from 2000 that looked at going to the heart of the matter, do negative emotions cause coronary heart disease? And so we can look at that and looking at that, that has an impact on maybe anxiety and depression. And the conversation kind of can be sometimes, what comes first? your physical conditions or your mental health conditions. Obesity, clinical depression, and eating disorders can have been correlated. Studies, evidence has shown that. So a study in 1990, panic disorder and cardiovascular um, problems and the results that come from that. So that the panic disorder has an impact on your cardiovascular system and vice versa. Um, and certainly when you have um, even something that is very common in our community and many communities is asthma. So there was a study um, in 2000 that was on the prevalence of DSM-5 anxiety and affective disorders in a pediatric population of asthmatic children. So the idea that asthma that many of our young children in schools face can have that correlation. Um, we're not saying causation, but maybe that correlation of the asthmatic um, and there's a, that relationship with asthma and maybe anxiety and depression. So we can see that interconnection, that it has this ongoing interconnection. Um, and so, but the, also the goal is not to make people feel bad about it as well, because we're also, our bodies are just that, they're bodies. So they are fragile. So you really do also need to take care of the mental health and the physical health, but not to make yourself feel bad about it. The goal is not to make anyone feel bad or horrible about what is happening in their bodies. It's just to honor what is happening in your body and then to listen to your body and then to do something about it. That's really what we want you to do is honor your body because um, it's speaking to us all the time. Um, and one of the things I thought that was I like is this, um, which is this little, uh, it, what I was just talking about, cartoon, which is no health without mental health. So the, the doctor or the therapist is saying, are you depressed because you have diabetes or is diabetes causing your depression? And the person is saying, yes. And I know sometimes that can be for your own personal health things that you're like, yeah, both. <laughs> and again, it's like, I don't know which came first and does it even really matter? Now we know we have this, how do we deal and address and take care of ourselves? Um, and so one of those things that we really want to do is beginning to talk about the symptoms and looking at the stress about the medical symptoms. So medical conditions can lead to pressure and changes in your lifestyle. And then you have unplanned and unwanted lifestyle changes. And then the patient feels worse. So it begins this cycle. So again, it's what I was talking about where we don't know where it comes first, what comes first. And in reality, as a therapist, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Um, by training, um, as well as a school counselor, many, many years as a school counselor um, and the public schools, um, I, I, I firmly believe, it, I don't, it doesn't even matter to me 
which came first that can be helpful with informing some things but ultimately it's about once again that mental wellness mental health not blaming yourself giving yourself grace um, as well as any physical conditions really giving yourself grace honoring your body um, and I speak a lot about that, the, really the importance with honoring your body and training now at the university level, training our students to do that. So again, this is that cycle that we talk about. So this is looking at really the physical symptoms of tire and fatigue. Then you might see behavioral changes and then the physical symptoms, which doesn't help if you are ill or you have some sort of physical illness, but yet you are also having the, the, um, the impact of the mental health challenges that you may be experiencing in that moment. So all of these things begin to be this intertwined cycle that is working together to really sometimes not help support your physical wellness as well as your mental health wellness. Um, and so as I say all of those things, I also wanna then think about or highlight here the, what we were just talking about, again, that physical mental health impact. So this really takes a look at, and I can share these slides out later, where you're kind of looking at also the other maybe additional variables that are coming in place. So you have your explanatory variables, maybe physical and mental health, but then there are other variables, social factors, lifestyle choices. I mean, we right now we're living in the biggest social impact that we have, which is this pandemic. Um, and so that has had a huge impact on your physical health and your mental health. And I always tell people right now, and I say it again and again and again, I say to anybody, you are having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And I say it again, you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Are you a little bit irritable? That's a normal reaction. Are you eating a little bit more than you normally would? Are you not sleeping as much as you normally would? Those are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. Is your blood pressure higher than it normally would be? Are you not maybe, is your BMI a little bit, not what it usually is? Those are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. Stop looking at and saying, oh, and beating yourself up. Give yourself grace. And then once you give yourself grace, as you begin to look at, once again, these factors that I talk about, those additional variables, then start to think about, because then they have a, 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 an impact on your outcome variables, either your physical health or your mental health, then really begin to look at what recommendations um, that can take place. So I always like to leave um, when I finish up with something with really some tangible walkaways. So if nothing else, I talked about all that other stuff, which you probably already know about, but hopefully you have some self-care strategies in place to take care of your physical health and your mental wellness. Um, and so those can be things along the lines of, and that's what I said, I was going to shout out the Prince George's County Rec Department. I... I, I don't get paid by them. I love Prince George's County Rec Department, even before anything. I, I've done things with there. They have the best, um, I've done, taken my kids fishing, archery. Yes, you can do fishing and archery and in, um, a platoon boat ride. I mean, it's so just peaceful and relaxing. Nature hikes all within my backyard for uh, like pennies on the dollar. So you have in your own backyard, in your own community, a place to go to escape when you can maybe have this staycation. And there's so many different things that they have, even now that they've moved to virtual, they have some virtual activities. So I just really strongly encourage people to look within their own to kind of take care of their mental health and mental well being, as well as their physical health. Um, and they have so many trained people who are just wonderful to take the time to walk and talk with you about a variety of different things from, I mean, I've learned about a little bit about bird watching and archery, which is not something I typically would have done, but really enjoyed doing um, when I did it with a park ranger. So, I mean, it, I just strongly encourage you, even for your own personal, but also for someone else. Lastly, and I'll wrap up, is really social support. So before one of the other ones, we had a virtual nutrition services that are provided by Giant Foods, Kaiser Permanente. So so many different healthcare providers are offering that social, social, psychosocial interventions, even with your own agencies, probably. And then working, of course, with that integrated care, with your primary care, making sure that they're connected with your mental health, which you already know about that because you're probably doing that. And then also social organizations. Get involved. Um, if you like to do different things, find a club that's out there. There's a club out there for you. Get involved. And if not, create a club because we need that social interaction. So Hopefully this was helpful, informative, and engaging. And my name is Nikki Hamm, um, Dr. Nikki Hamm. I'm with uh, Bowie State University and I'll um, leave my contact information if you have any. Thank you.
Thank you, Nikki. This was fantastic and so cool. <laughs> All right. So unfortunately, Linda is unable to present today. So we will move on to the suicide prevention portion of our presentation. Thank yeah. you again, Nikki. We'll have Amy Shields, the Vice President of Operations and Reimagination Productions. I'm the chief of the in charge of the suicide prevention program at Find Mind Doula to present next. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> All right. So I uh, bear with me. I don't know how to spotlight the way that uh, Nikki just did. So I'm going to set my timer though. So I know my time. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Shields. I'm the vice president of operations at Mindula Health. And I have uh, the pleasure of overseeing our adolescent and young adult suicide prevention program. Um, this is a pilot program for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Mindula and then how we um, kind of got involved with this pilot program that we really want to be able to expand um, across the country and kind of where we got started. So first, Mindula. Um, oops, sorry. We provide, um, we're a next generation population health management company, and we scale the human connection utilizing our 24 seven team of care extenders and care managers with our technology. And we deliver um, tech enabled team-based support and care across the continuum of health. And we have various programs, um, both locally in Maryland, but also across the United States. And in, for this particular, um, you know, just for today, I am going to obviously focus just on suicide prevention, but this, this beginning part, these are the key elements of all the programs that we provide here at Mindula. Um, and it's really, I think, truthfully, why the suicide prevention program is as successful as it is, is that we've taken our service formula, which is, again, 24-7 team-based tech-enabled care extenders and care managers combined with our technology. So our integrated multi-platform um, is very, it's an engagement tool with analytics. Um, where our tech team is amazing. They have, they do this amazing data and risk stratification so we can ensure that we are serving the most crucial populations across you know, the United States. Kind of coupled with, we've got psychiatry oversight where we're using measurement-based care, we're doing validated assessments and we're constantly watching the improvement of all of our members and patients. And overall, this is equaling this, the better outcomes. So a little bit about what our technology is because I think this is very key to the youth that we're serving. Again, can't emphasize enough, we're 24 seven. We provide um, a HIPAA compliant app for our, our members to utilize. This is where there is the opportunity to have a daily check-in. We were fortunate enough to work a couple of years ago with Georgetown University Hospital to come up with a, an algorithm of questions to ask on a daily basis so that we can track at a very um, kind of a low end how our patients and members are progressing and how they're doing. Coupled with additional validated assessments, we get, we're able to look at the clinical improvement as well as that daily personal connection that we're making and the improvements we're seeing over time. So within this app, again, it looks almost like your text messaging. You can send texts, you can send pictures, videos. Um, you can even do emojis now. We keep making it you know, more and more looking like a, a typical text conversation, but it's all HIPAA compliant and it's within our own app, which is you know, helpful given the, the, the populations that we're serving. Um, additionally, within this app, you can schedule a, a phone call or an appointment, or you can also have a one-touch dial to our main number. So what we're also super proud of at Mindula is that we're not a call center. We don't outsource our main number at all. It is um, all Mindula uh, behavioral health professionals who are trained um, who are answering our phones 24 seven. Um, and they also, um, you know, they have access to who, who is calling. You get to know your folks. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a huge team, which is nice. So it's personalized as well. Uh, additionally on the app, we've got some great content that is accessible to those folks that are utilizing our app. Um, you'll, you're going to see on the next slide that if a, if a member doesn't have access to a smartphone, which is you know not always the case, we do have a member portal that our folks can log into. So there's still an opportunity to see some of this content, to have the HIPAA compliant uh, messaging amongst the members and the care team, um, as well as you're going to see, we're kind of going to start to get into some of the suicide prevention stuff here where this is kind of the, the meat of some of the work we do is that there is this content available on our portal as well as on our app for all the, the youth and the, the members. So now all of these things that Mindula is proud of and our tech and our teams, we have taken and we have 
um, kind of couple this into our new program, uh, the adolescent and young adult program. So a little bit about how we got started is we have been fortunate enough um, to have a relationship with payers. So we work with hospitals, we work with primary care physicians, and we work with payers as well. So this past August, we were um, awarded the opportunity um, to, to start with the, the program. So just um, the need is obviously it exists. I think many of us know that um, suicide is on the rise. It's been in the news more often amongst the youth population. After each suicide attempt, 60 to 80% of adolescents and young adults will make another attempt within one to three months, continuing this negative cycle of behavior without intervention. So um, Clark County in Nevada has really been on um, in the news, and there had been a surge in their, you know, st the student suicide. Um, there was 18 suicides over nine months of closure, which was double the nine the district had the previous year. So we are serving our pilot um, in Clark County. And um, at a high level, I want to go over how we provide this service. So even though we start up top here with this virtual parent and guardian, I want to start at the bottom. So we serve the members. The young adult has a dedicated 24 seven virtual and in-person support team. They it's daily check-ins utilizing the app. We have crisis support. It's an intensive intake at the, on, when they're enrolled, where we're utilizing our discovery assessment, we're asking lots of assessments, really getting to know these, these members. We create a safety plan immediately, which is also available at one, one touch right on the app for them, um, as well as on our, our platform. Um, we are providing psychosocial support and skills training, care coordination. We're ensuring that they are connected to therapists and psychiatrists. We're making community um, connections for them and providing them with the resources that they need. The model that is also helping us to achieve success within this program is that we don't just serve the adolescent, but we also serve their parent or guardian. In some instances, this person could be what we call a proxy. Um, we have members who are about 18 or 19 years old, and they might be in a long-term relationship. You know, we've had a couple who are married, so the proxy can be a loved one. They also have a dedicated virtual um, care manager who's providing another an additional intensive level of support of outbound calling and regular check-ins. We also have, a, they have the availability of our app. They have DBT and communications uh, skills training available. So we are teaching them, you know, the signs of suicide, the warning signs, improving their communication um, and ensuring that they can keep their loved ones safe. I did prepare two, uh, two of our really good news stories, um, but unfortunately I know that I'm running out of time, but would love to be able to share this um, with everybody if that works. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I'll quickly do one, one story that I think really shows the impact of the model of serving not just the young adult, but also the parents. So we had a member who, when she was enrolled, the mother um, was not, uh, did not have knowledge of the signs of suicide and was really struggling with communicating effectively with her young daughter. Um, we were able to help her to learn um, the skills that she needed, um, including the risk factors, the warning signs of suicide. Um, and this is all information that's avail readily available on our app where they, you know, it's, there's content and videos to watch. Um, this information really helped to educate this, um, the parent of the young, the young adult. Um, she was also provided with additional resources on effective communication and other various resources to kind of reduce the stress in the family, um, you know, through the social services out in Nevada. So the member's mother has really been able to feel more confident in her ability to be supportive to her young daughter and her time of needs. She's used the information that she learned to better be able to communicate um, with her daughter as well as her other children, which has reduced the family stress. Um, the member was recently able to tell the mom that one of her family members had made her uncomfortable. Previously, the member was afraid to talk about her feelings and her fear of her mom uh, becoming angry. And everyone's now learning how to better trust and communicate and it's having a positive impact on their relationship. Um, and then just really quick, one last thought is, you know, one of the things that this is a pilot and we're, we, while we're waiting to be, have better results, um, we are proud to say that to date, we have not had any um, suicide attempts amongst this population in the cohort that we have been serving. Um, so, so far it's really, um, it's been, it's been very eye opening and an awesome experience. So thanks to everybody for letting me talk today. Thank you, Amy, for sharing mm -hmm. that information and uh, what awful statistics, but what a nice um, story to share and what a nice um, platform that you have. And it's great that you have some you know, success with that. So thank you. And I think we will have time again for some more questions and discussions. So if anybody has questions um, about Mindula or about any other program, feel free to drop in the chat and we will open up the questions at the end of the presentations as well. 
Um, and so we will move on to Scott Showalter, the mental health coordinator for Prince, Prince George's Public County Schools. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Megan. Appreciate that. So I'm just gonna talk about, as my PowerPoint's coming up on the screen, just gonna talk about sources of strength. So let me get into it. I do have a short video talk about sources of strength. So about a year and a half ago, so we wrote a federal grant and we were able to secure it and in partnership with Bowie State University and the University of Maryland. Um, their interns are in 10 of our schools. Here are the 10 schools. So they have graduate interns who are in 10 of our schools that you see here, eight middle schools and two high schools. So the graduate interns along with their supervisors, counseling supervisors, along with about five staff members who may be teachers, um, other related service providers, like school psychologists, for example, who provide support and implementation of sources of strength. And you're probably wondering, what am I talking about? What is sources of strength? So I'm gonna show you a brief video, and then I'm just gonna give you a short demonstration of sources of strength. So here's the video, hopefully Sir. you can hear it. Source of Strength is a program that uses peer leaders to go out and try to change social norms and climates across whole populations and spread messages of hope, spread messages of strength and help. At Source of the Strength, we don't view our peer leaders as junior psychologists or counselors and send them out to fix all of their friends. We really ultimately view them as these agents of social change. And we take what we call a social network approach, that we all exist within these social networks and we know that things can spread through a network. There's a lot of emerging science on this. What we've learned is that positive things can spread through a network. Things like hope and resiliency and strength and connection and trust towards adults can spread through a network. And so we really view our peer leaders as these agents of social change, as the patient zero of an epidemic of health, of a contagion of strength within their school and community. I think Social Strength is unique in the fact that it's um, a positive program. It's uplifting. It deals with the strengths that you have around you instead of the negatives. Source of Strength is, in the model, aimed not only at addressing the needs of students who may be in crisis to, to help connect them to natural Role, as well as formal helping resources, but it's also to increase the number of students that have adults that they're in connection with, because we know that's an important protective factor. What are things that kind of give you strength who are people? What are your favorite activities? Source of Strength has peer leader teams going in middle school, high school, college, university, community, cultural groups, as well as faith-based groups. And these peer teams can go out and spread hope, help, strength messages, and they adapt those messages to kind of fit their culture. Research has shown that we've been able to break down codes of silence, increase perceptions of adult support, increase help-seeking behaviors, and enhance protective factors associated with reducing risk across a whole school population. Since we started Source of the Strength at our school, we're definitely all more connected and more encouraging to one another, and it feels more like a family rather than just a body of students. The Sources of Strength program would be great for any school, any community. It uh, creates a caring environment that allows people to feel understood. I just can't say enough good about it. It supports reaching out. It supports, it, it's against isolation. It's about healthy, help-seeking behaviors. It's about life. The other thing I like about it is, is we do get assistance on this from outside. It's not all completely in here. We've got people coming in and helping us periodically throughout the year. You need some of those different voices from time to time. It can't always be the same people saying the same things. I think it's good when, when our students and our staff hear it from people outside. Sources of Strength isn't a one-shot assembly style program. It's designed to be implemented over the course of a school year and ideally multiple years because that's really when we start to see systemic culture change happening. A program that can address the, the priorities of, of the schools, their primary educational mission, as well as uh, the mission of, of enhancing well-being of students is, is an important and a wise investment for communities to make. So basically, when I get really get down to it, Source of Strength is pretty unique because it's peer led, that's one thing I didn't say. Um, at each school you have about seven adults, including the counselor, graduate, intern, who's supporting it, but it's really peer led. Um, this is the first year that we've done the training. We trained the adults, we trained about 10 to 25 students at each of the schools that I mentioned previously. And what they're doing is communicating strengths through campaigning and messaging. And they, they have some templated campaigns that they can do, they can focus the 25 students get with adults and they can focus on a certain message to their peers about physical health or mentors or healthy activities, for example. 
And what you're seeing here on the screen is the sources of strength wheel. And the idea is essentially that maybe we are strong in certain areas, we meaning an individual, maybe we're strong in positive friends. Maybe we have a close friend, we can easily get a hold of them. Um, but maybe we're not as strong in our physical health or mental health, or we not engaging our health activities as much. Maybe those are some areas we want to grow in. The other idea, or the main philosophy behind sources of strength, is that you're making coping contagious. So by sharing our strengths, you're making it more likely that others are going to share how they how they engage in strength. Um, there's a trusted adult campaign that schools do, where the peer leaders, the student leaders, they identify who are the trusted adults for them, and they communicate that either through video. Um, probably virtual, you know, and hybrid learning would be through video, social media, and they get to pick the platform, the messaging, how are they going to engage their peers? The idea is not to just give information like is done too often, but to engage as many students in the school as possible to share what are their strengths or get them to really think about, am I strong in generosity? Is there something I can do to increase that area of strength or healthy activities? So I'm going to ask you just as a quick example, what brings you joy? When we think about healthy activities, if we go back to here to the chart, go back to the chart here, one of the parts of the pie is healthy activities. So what's something that you do that brings you joy? And specifically, I'm gonna ask you, what music brings you joy? I think most of us like music, at least some genre, era, maybe the 50s or 60s or the 80s, um, but what brings you joy? And if you can just throw it in the chat for me, um, or is a specific singer that when you listen to that singer in the morning, on a Friday morning or a Monday morning, it gets you going. Well, gospel music, I see people say. What else brings you joy? I'm trying to get a song list here for myself. Maybe somebody else can borrow it here. Um, broad, Broadway, interesting. Somebody direct message me to Broadway, interesting. Um, I, I'm originally from Michigan, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, although I didn't grow up in this era, Motown music was often in my ear through my parents. And there's something about Motown music, positive, the love songs in Motown. I don't know, I, I just like it. Um, Kirk Franklin, definitely. Josh Groban. So this is an activity, I actually did it last night. I, you can do it with parents. It, it's, uh, it blends across cultures. We had a diverse group of parents last night that we're doing this with. We had a, a variety of songs, as you can imagine, from all the way from the 1950s all the way up to the 2021s. We had some students on the call as well, and we put together a song list. And it was just interesting. People kind of explained why particular songs put them in a certain mood. Maybe you need an up, some upbeat song. Maybe you need a song that kind of is more on the same level as your current mood. Maybe you need that sometimes. Or maybe you need, just need something relaxing and soothing without too many lyrics. Skate music, Hamilton soundtrack, interesting. Yeah, soundtrack music is definitely good. So this is a quick activity that we do. Um, again, sources of strength is something we implemented just starting this year as I speak. We have one more school group of peer leaders that we're training. Students seem to like it. And you know, one thing I didn't mention that's extremely important is not only is it peer led, but it's not led by your typical group of peers. We're not just getting the student president or the captain of the basketball team um, we're intentionally trying to find peer leaders within different groups. You imagine you go into the lunchroom pre-COVID, you try to identify who are the peer leaders in the different groups, the music students, the art students. Um, and I'm just going to share my art that I did recently. I'm no artist, but I'm going to share this. Um, it's the Capitol Wheel that I painted. So we try to engage students in different campaigns to get them to think about their different strengths, areas they want to grow in sharing because we don't want it to all be about the risk factors warning signs that's certainly important and that can be part of it but again emphasis on strengths through about six campaigns throughout the school year and as i end i know i'm at my time probably a little over just want to share these resources i'm pretty sure everyone on the call i know many of you on this call are probably very familiar with the resource except the very bottom um that's my twitter handle if you'd like to follow me i retweet a lot of information from a lot of the great national local state providers that we have so that's all I have. And I thank you for your time. I hope you all are doing well. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, especially into the weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. That's a great program. And it's a great idea to focus on the positive and what you shine light on grows. So that's a great program. I appreciate your time today and sharing it. And before we get to questions, we actually do have one more presenter. Um, Kim Rush Lynch is able to share a little bit about a school gardening program. And then we'll open up to questions. So Kim. Good morning, everyone. 
I was going to um, just have a few comments at the end of Linda's presentation today, but unfortunately she's not able to join us. So I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, one of the school systems program, the Environment Ag and Natural Resources program. We have three schools in the county that participate in the program, Fairmont Heights, High Point, and Gwen Park High Schools. And these programs are awesome. These schools have greenhouses where they're growing plants inside. You know, some of them are using them for, um, you know, some of their science classes and their ag classes, but some of them are actually using them as an entrepreneurial project. And they're, you know, the Glen Park, for example, has an annual plant sale each year. So I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about those programs as, you know, outlets for students. It's a healthy activity and a supportive environment. Um, you know, obviously helps with team building, building confidence and character and all of those wonderful things. Um, so I actually had, I wanted to share the website with you. I don't know if I have the ability to share my screen. I do, okay. And I wanted to also share with you a couple of videos of the programs just to kind of give you an idea. And then I'll mention a few other programs in the county. So this is the landing page and I will drop this in the box um, for the program within the school system. Uh, it's a three-year program. They use the Curriculum for Agricultural Science Education, but these students are also a part of two organizations, FFA, which used to stand for Future Farmers of America, but now it's just FFA because they wanted to get away from people thinking that agriculture was just about, you know, soil and digging in the soil. Um, so they they just call it FFA now, but they have a variety of regional and national competitions that our students have participated in. Everything from public speaking, prepared, and also extemporaneous speaking, um, to just a general knowledge about environment and ag issues. So I'm gonna share this particular video with you guys. Now let's all sing. What's your name? Katie. Katie had a little <laughs> It may have been the first time that Katie Tatakis and her classmates had ever held a lamb, but what an impression it made. For as they snuggled and bottle fed the orphaned three-day-old Mr. Darcy, the Gwynn Park High School freshmen were all weighing whether or not to enroll in their school's three-year agricultural academy a program made all the more irresistible by cuddly farm animals. This is sort of a, a, a gateway lamb that they might consider, you know, spending more time around these animals and, and doing work around um, agriculture and natural resource management. There are so many opportunities for them, and I really feel many young people, all of us, I guess, truly connect to animals. Would you consider doing something related to agriculture as a profession? Yeah, because now that I actually got an experience one-on-one, it's, it seems like it's a good idea. Yeah. To entice the freshmen on what was deemed Agvocacy Day at Gwynn Park, dozens of upper-class students and their teachers set up four stations, all designed to convince any skeptics that agriculture is cutting edge. Call it agriculture. And we're working really hard to make ag sexy. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to make ag sexy because yeah. there is the there is the preconceived sec, um, notion that it's cows, plows, and sows. It's only production ag, and that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. So right now, in the United States, there are uh, 20,000 students graduating from college, but there's 60,000 jobs available mm -hmm. for students in agriculture. So our students are. Um, moving into environmental science, we have students that want to do pre-vet, we have ag business, ag law. So we're running the whole gamut, we're really not doing just production ag. For students who have been in the program, their satisfaction with it is obvious. For whether they're explaining how aquaponics channels fish waste into healthy nutrients for plants to grow without soil, or chasing after their own homegrown chickens. And yes, they sell the eggs for feed money. They need no convincing that agriculture is not just Prince George's past, it is its future. When I was a freshman, yeah. um, they were eggs, like they were just hatching. So yeah. we've got to you know, create a bond with them over the years, so yeah. So these are your babies? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Why are you in this program? 
Um, I'm very environmentally cautious and I actually wanted to be an environmentalist before I came in the program and just learning about how agriculture shapes the world and how we can do stuff to help um, I think that's the best part of being in this program. What do you like about this program? Um, I just like the freedom you know there's so many possibilities there's so many different career paths in the world that you can do anything. Agriculture with a capital A, there's so many different jobs out there. Some of them are really interested in culinary arts, and so they're growing gardens and bringing that into, um, into the public sphere. And, you know, we talk about the history of agriculture um, being a part of Prince George's County, but I also feel like it's the future. It's a very exciting county. Um, we still have what they call the rural tier, but there's also so many urban ag possibilities as well. And more and more people are realizing the benefits of being very close to the food system. For the potential recruits who learned you can get a green thumb if you transplant carefully, and that trash needn't be forever when you learn cornstarch can be converted into plastic that's biodegradable, the day's pitch seem for many to be pitch perfect. This is a renewable source of materials that is not going to go away if we use too much of it because we're always growing more corn. Um, plus, it just rewards the ingenuity of scientists who are learning, you know, are exploring with different ways of how to use this, this big product that we have in the United States. You guys did a wonderful job. Thank you for stopping and learning about plants and the program here. I hope to see you folks next year as you're part of the program. What are some of the things you have to remember when you transplant a plant? You can't just, just pop it up and pop it in. No, you, you gotta uh, make sure you take your fingers under the roots so you don't rip the roots out of the plants. You yeah. sound like a farmer to me already. Yeah. Yeah. You have a garden at home? No. You think you might want to start one? No. Ah, <laughs> that was the wrong answer. In this one? land of plenty, where boys. President Herbert Hoover once promised Americans a chicken in every pot, Food abundance and security are too often taken for granted. But thanks to students in agriculture programs like wind parks, there is hope for the challenges that lie ahead. The people that I met through this program, the different skills that I've been able to learn, because ninth grade I wasn't as well spoken as he was. I was kind of shy and reserved, but now I've worked on my public speaking and I've gone to different events and different competitions and talked about different things like water quality and food waste that you know I just learned through this academy. Of course, it's a whole fine and good to keep us well fed. Just so tonight's roast isn't Mr. Darcy or that chicken in the pot is it my newest best friend? <laughs> this is Dave Zarin reporting. Okay. So that is that. Um, I have actually one other video if there is time and I will definitely answer questions. Um, actually, we'll, we'll pause the video. I can always share that at a different time. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I have I can say, I'll drop in the chat box some other videos that you can watch in your own time later. Um, the program we would love to expand the program, but again, of course, it's always a funding issue. Um, you know, in terms because this program does require a lot of stuff that tends to be a little bit more expensive than some of the other CTE programs, the career and technical education programs in the county. Um, I also mentioned quickly that Eco City Farms does a great summer program for students as well as our. Um, University of Maryland Extension, they have a 4-H program and work with students doing similar things. Um, and yes, it's this is at uh, Wind Park High School, Fairmont Heights, and High Point. And there is talk of expanding it possibly to Suitland and Bowie at some point, but again, we're talking about a funding issue. So anyway, thank you guys very much and uh, appreciate your time and inviting me. Thank you so much, Kim. And just to share, um, Scott's comment in case someone can't see the chat. He did say the program is so great for, um, uh, according to research, it increases students' connectedness to adults, school engagement, peer referral rate, and acceptability of seeking help. So thank you, Kim, for sharing about your program. Um, and now we'll just open up the chat. I did see some questions earlier in um, about previous programs, and then we'll open up to the um, questions about the garden as well. Um, there's a question from my doula, from Larry F. 
Larry said, it, Rondula, it's a wonderful idea. Can you walk us through what happens when a consumer alerts you to negative mood state or suicidal ideation through your app? What is the sequence of support? Um, sure. Thanks, Larry. Um, happy to answer. So our, our care extenders uh, really build that rapport uh, pretty quickly with the members, particularly because it is daily outreach. Um, we, the, the suicide prevention program has the highest engagement rate and the most app usage across our programs at Mindula. Um, and so if the care extender is not available, our system is automatically set up that if they don't respond within, um, there's the way it, there's natural language processing within the app. And if it is a high alert and someone does not respond, I think it's within five minutes, then it's, it's escalated to um, the additional program, um, the team and the leaders on that team, as well as our on-call team. Um, so somebody is usually responding to those messages very quickly. Um, and we're either responding directly on the app or we're calling. Um, again, our, our lines are staffed 24 seven. So if these members also know that if they are in an emergency situation and we don't respond, they get an auto population, like it auto populates reminding them, if you don't hear from us immediately, please call our main number if you, if you need something. So we have lots of uh, tools in place to ensure that they know that if, you know, if someone's not immediately available, they know what next step to take. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. I, I find your system really fascinating. Um, have you decided what is your target population? Obviously, these are kids who need daily monitoring. You know, who in Prince George's County will you be monitoring? Sure. So as we've been in conversations with Prince George's County, we are trying to get a, a uh, an additional pilot started. And the, the hope is that we're touching those that are um, discharging from some of the local hospitals who may have, they may have been um, hospitalized for suicidal ideation or an attempt to try to reduce the, you know, just the statistics and the studies are showing to decrease the, the opportunity to have a subsequent event. Um, it's still early conversations with the county, um, but we are trying to, to figure out how to risk stratify. So something that we've been able to do at the payer level is take the claims data and risk stratify it. Um, that's, this is a little different because we want to work at the hospital level um, for some of the local hospitals um, with the, the young adults and trying to ensure that we're touching upon those that are at uh, high risk for a subsequent event. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Larry, for your question. Uh, there's a question from the chat from Dr. Karen Payne. What is the deciding factor for those schools? And I believe the question was regarding the sources of strength program. Um, so what are the deciding factors for the schools getting the program, Dr. Payne? Was that the question? Yes, that was the question. Yeah, so the primary factors were um, suspension data, attendance data, um, suicide intervention data, we have our own internal, anytime we show out this person's suicide ideation, we have our own internal data. And then the other big factor was buy-in from the administration. That was the last factor. Also, the intern supervisor had to commit to the program because it's a long-term, the grant that we have is five years. So we are in year two, but the federal government will probably extend it due to COVID. Um, we're into year, year two now. We actually brought a grant just um, about a month ago or so to expand sources of strength to 20 additional schools. So that would be uh, middle school, high schools, not all of them, it would be about half of them total. You're welcome. We have one more question, Scott, for your uh, sources of strength program. It's from Larry F. Is, do you think it's effective because students are more likely to tell other students about suicide ideation than adults or professionals? And why do you feel it's, a, it's approach is successful with its peer approach? Yeah, I, I think it's the big thing it's successful, I think is increased trust between the students and the adults. Um, the one of the programs, one of the campaigns that I mentioned before, it's it looks different because the students get to use their creativity, but it's increasing um, sharing with students who are the trusted adults in the school. So not necessarily all the students. What we've seen at other schools, because our schools are just implementing this now, what I've seen at other schools across the nation is either through social media, videos, they'll have like a three to four minute video and they might flash all the trusted adults on the screen. Or if we were in school in person, they would have like um, almost like a tree or whatever you want to design it as. Any students would be prompted to identify who's your trusted adult and why. And that might be in a high traffic area, like on the way to the cafeteria, for example. So students would walk by that at least once a day in the cafeteria or if it's in the main hall and see, oh, these are trusted adults. These are who my peers are saying 
the trusted adults are. Maybe they're more likely to refer their peers, at least according to the research. Um, during the grant, we do have a part of our evaluation section. We are tracking peer referrals, adult referrals, just trying to see if there's differences. Also, we have a pre-posted survey looking at acceptability and knowledge around um, suicide warning signs. Although we don't talk a lot about suicide warning signs in the program, we are adding it on um, as an add-on to sources of strength. Thank you, Scott. There's a question for Kim about the FFA program. Can you describe how that program's changed since the schools uh, moved to virtual model due to COVID? Yeah, so what, from what I understand, they're still meeting virtually. Um, unfortunately, the teacher is doing a lot more, um, especially the one that has chickens at the school. They also have two pigs, so she's, you know, back and forth every day. Um, but yeah, they're still meeting. They're just doing things virtually. For example, they have an FFA regional competition coming up um, next month. And again, that will be in a virtual format. So they're still going. It's not ideal, but they're doing the best that they can with the circumstances. And I'll open it now to any questions that uh, were not entered into the chat. Anybody want to unmute themselves and share comments or questions? Yeah, I have a question for Kim. Um, Kim, I'm curious. I, there's a private school. It's a private school, uh, religious affiliation in Hyattsville. And they used to have a dog at the school. And it wasn't, it was like an office dog. I, I don't know, you know, how they got around that, you know, legally. But anyway, um, the kids loved it. And it was not, again, it wasn't just one student's pet, but it could visit classes and anything. Just curious in the non-public schools, I'm in public schools, of course, probably not gonna happen, but in the non-public schools, have you seen that anywhere where they actually have a pet on the site? I kind of stepped away for a second. I'm not sure. Um, That's okay. That's okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I think I was on mute. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, so I do know of a couple of non-public schools that have like rabbits or chickens, pets like that. Um, and of course, you see fish in the classroom. Um, but usually, nothing too much beyond that. Any other questions or comments? I found in chat the kids are amazing. And I think we all agree with that comment. Any, anything else we want to share? I, I do want to share, this is Anthony Nolan with Parks and Rec. Um, I do want to share a, a great partnership that we were able to develop last spring, um, you know, with the, the program shutting down and school shutting down in March. Uh, the FAA had grown all these uh, seedlings for a fundraiser and uh, Prince George's Soil Conservation Service was able to come in, buy the plants, and then uh, we had uh, meal distribution programs going on. So we were able to uh, hand them out at our food uh, distribution programs um, throughout the county. And I, I've got to tell you, the kids were extremely excited. The parents were extremely excited to get things such as a tomato plant, a pepper plant. I mean, it was it was really heartwarming to see the, the, the interest and the desire to grow out the plants. So it was, it was a wonderful opportunity. And, you know, we, we would continue to um, love to continue to be a partner with that. With, and that was with Gwen Park. Uh, but yeah, any of the schools, we, we would love to work with them. Great. Any, any other comments or um, any partnerships we can always help facilitate as the coalition to put you in touch? This is Anthony. You know, just one more thing. Um, our therapeutic recreations uh, section also did a partnership uh, with regard to mental health, uh, specifically regarding um, uh, mental health among youth. And they hosted or co-hosted a chalk art festival um, last spring for two weeks where folks were, we, we again, at the, our meal distribution programs, we were handing out buckets of sidewalk chalk, chalk and then inviting people to take pictures and submitting, submit them to be posted on, um, on our, well, I it wasn't our website, but, um, but to just share that. And it was 
uh, again, amazing the, uh, the level of creativity and, and artistic abilities um, among all the people that participated in that program. And it was a great, you know, during that time, we were looking for any way to kind of help relieve the stress that everybody was feeling. So, you know, when we have partnerships like that, it's, it's really, um, you know, working as a team, you know, not just, you know, working on the physical, feeding them, but also on the, on the mental and emotional with the activities, rec recreational activities. Thank you for that, Anthony. And thank you everyone for attending today's meeting. Thank you to our presenters. I thought, I think that this was an awesome meeting. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop here. We are at 12 p.m. And just remember, if you have any questions or just want to connect with any of the presenters, feel free to email Megan and I, and we will go ahead and make that connection for you. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. Great job, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone.